What's up, Hyperfast Agent Nation? On this episode of the podcast, we've got a special guest. He has built and sold multiple businesses. He has three decades of experience as an entrepreneur, and he recently wrote a book to help people get control of their personal finances and make more money with the money that they make from their businesses. Welcome to the show, Henry Doss. Welcome to the show, Henry. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm great. How are you doing? Happy Monday. Good. Yeah, same to you. I like I like the studio setup, by the way. Yeah, this is my war room, as I call it. So I got all my tech. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to dive into some of your superpowers, some of what you've done in, you know, starting businesses, selling businesses, helping entrepreneurs uh, increase their sales efficiency. And I know our audience is excited about that. Why don't we start off just by getting a little bit of background on you, who you are, what, what you've done and, and why you're here today. Okay, good. Uh, I'll be concise. So I'm a 30 year entrepreneur uh, for the last probably uh, most of this past decade, I've been a business coach. So I coach entrepreneurs, generally uh, folks with businesses, a million dollar plus. Uh, although I have a, a new client who's pretty much a startup. Um, I don't do a lot with startups, basically, because they don't have the money to pay me. Um, so that's <laughs> as simple as that. Uh, I wrote a book that I published, self-published last fall called FQ Financial Intelligence. It's 18 chapters about pretty much from cradle to grave, everything I think you should know about how to grow and manage your money. You know, and I sell a course around that as well. So, uh, and now I'm working on some, some um, curated masterminds that I'm doing. So I do a, uh, I'm running a mastermind on passive investing right now. So I do a bunch of stuff in and around entrepreneurship and money, pretty much the, the thematic elements. Awesome. Well, we are excited to have you on. I know you've got a lot to offer. I'm a little curious, you know, since you've got your, your one client now, you mentioned that's a, a startup. What's, what's the difference, you know, coaching that type of client versus the ones that already have a million dollars in, in revenue? Like, what are the, the differences and the challenges that, that, that they have? And, and how are you helping, you know, the startup guy? as opposed to the, the people that are already at that million dollar level? Great question. Um, so the folks that are million dollars plus, um, generally they have at least some headcount. Uh, it's pretty rare to find someone who's a solopreneur, although I do, do know, have known of a couple of people who are solopreneurs who do a million dollars plus. Just to give you a little context, there's about 30 million businesses in the US and only 4% of those businesses ever hit a million dollars in any given year. So it's, it's kind of a rarefied area. We, you know, we toss that number around a little bit because it's a nice D mark, but uh, it's pretty difficult for most businesses to get there. As a business coach, unless I want to take on a hundred clients, I'm never going to get to a million dollars a year and that's fine. Um, that's okay. So what we work on mainly there is, is sort of scaling up. Um, uh, hiring is a big issue as you, as you scale up. You've got to hire good people. You've got to sometimes uh, cut ties with people who are just not, who've kind of hit that ceiling, right? They've done as much as they could do for you as a small business, but they, their skill set has now hit a wall. Right. And that, that's, tough. Yeah, so that's the, business, gonna, the business outgrows them basically. Yeah. Basically that's what happened. Now businesses outgrow the entrepreneur, right? That's even a, a, a more difficult one when you get to a point where it's like, dude, I know you founded this company and you raised it up, but you're not the guy to take you to a $20 million company. That could be a harsh reality. Um, the startup is a different ball game. That's really more, they don't know what they don't know. Right. Some of them maybe have never run a business before or others have maybe started and stopped or had a side hustle. So 
that's more an exercise in kind of taking people's blinders off and getting them to focus on the critical path. What's the critical path? Where are we going? All right. So if, if the critical path is, Hey, I've got zero clients. Okay. Well then maybe we need to get that first client, right? Just like when I started in the coaching business, spent a lot of time just trying to get that first paying client, right? That's a very different challenge than somebody who's a million dollar company and wants to be $5 million two years from now, right? They're way past that first client thing. We're working on a whole bunch of other things. They may be in a situation where, again, they may, be, they may have to fire some of their clients. It's like, you've outgrown this client base. You need to level up and you need to change your metrics in terms of uh, what's a suitable deal for you, right? You deal with real estate professionals, it's the same kind of thing. Right. As you start moving up the ladder, you're saying, ah, I'm not, I don't want the hundred thousand dollar properties anymore. I've outgrown that. I know how to do that, but I, now it's like, I want to work to the half million dollar properties and then the million dollar properties and then the multi-million dollar MDUs, right? Iterative steps as you grow up your business. Yeah. So interesting stats out there, you know, only, only 4% of the 30 million plus businesses get to that million dollar level. I think in real estate, uh, the number is a lot less even, I, I believe um, less than 1% mm -hmm. of real estate agents ever get to the, ever get to like the 250 K level, according to, to NAR. I would so believe I, that. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm at even less uh, that, that hit that million dollar level and, and um I, th I think a lot of it probably has to do with hiring and, and, and scaling. Like a lot of agents get to six figures, maybe 200 grand. And then they just kind of, they just kind of stop and they, they never grow they, it beyond they plateau, themselves. Right. And they may be content with that. And there may be nothing wrong with that. They may be, per that may be perfectly good, but what they're going to spend their time on is preserving that 200 K base, not expanding that base to get it higher. Um, you know, most things fit Pareto. They fit the 80-20 rule. I think in the real estate business, it's something like over 90% uh, of the deals are done by way less than 10% of the brokers, right? I don't know. You, you're probably more plugged into it than, than I am in terms of those metrics. Um, but yeah, there are a ton of, of real estate agents out there who uh, maybe do one deal a year. Maybe it's a side hustle. Maybe it's something that's like, if I could pick up a little uh, extra scratch. I know people who have gone through the process of getting their real estate license just so they could buy a house for themselves and save a couple bucks on the commission, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that's been done. I have a friend who did that. Um, and now he's sort of dabbling and doing it for real because the real estate market here in the New York area is on fire right? There's, uh, there's been a, a bit of an exodus from New York City. So uh, we're back to, it's, it's as Yogi Berra would say, it's deja vu all over again. It, it's feeling a little like 2007, right? Where it was just a little bit out of control. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something uh, people are seeing in almost every market, uh, especially ones that are like a driving distance to, to a major city. So Mm -hmm. You know, we're definitely, definitely seen that. And I, I agree on that. The Pareto number, you know, normally uh, people quote it as 80, 20. And I, I think in real estate, it's, it's 90, 10 or, or even more. <laughs> or even more. Uh, right. So, so I agree with you there. I've, I've seen that. Have you seen other, you know, other service-based industries that, that you coach in that, that kind of have this similar challenge of, of the, the, the founder, the starter, you know, having, having, a problem or a challenge growing it from beyond just themselves, like in, in yeah. like a service-based industry versus others or any very, very, there? very, very common because the, the, you, you have to make a transition from being a, a doer or a worker. Uh, if we want to use the Michael Gerber e-myth kind of uh, nomenclature, um, you, you know, there's a big difference between being sort of the worker, the guy who's doing everything down in the weeds per se, uh, to being the entrepreneur who's really running things and more more pu pushing and pulling levers as opposed to actually doing things themselves. 
there's a tendency for entrepreneurs and myself included to just say, you know what, it's easier for me to roll up my sleeves and just do it myself than it is for me to teach somebody else how to do it, right? That's only gonna get you so far. Uh, eventually you will hit a plateau where you're just maxed out. That's, there's, you, there's just not enough you know, actual hours in the day to do all the things that need to be done. And then if you think about something in the, like the real estate business where you've got to go around and show homes to people, right? Think about just the logistics of that. I worked with a guy a number of years ago who had a startup idea that was in the, in the real estate sector. So, so, you know, we got very deep into that and he had developed a platform that was designed to optimize um, showings so that if let's say you had five showings in a day, it would figure out the optimal route for you to go and it would help you coordinate all the appointments you had to make for maximum efficiency, which I thought was a you know really, really great idea until you start doing it in practice and then you find out you can't get into a house, right? The lockbox doesn't work, right? Or the homeowner calls at the last minute and says, you know what, I gotta be home, I'm, I, I can't leave something with the kids, so you're gonna have to skip me, right? So it got very, very complex trying to get, trying to optimize that so that you could get maybe 90 more minutes out of your day. Eventually, even optimizing it ad infinitum, you're still gonna run out of time, right? So you gotta hire people. And that changes your job as, as, the, as, the, as the agent, right? You're not doing showings anymore. You're hiring people and they're doing it. And then you're managing their accounts. It's a whole different ball game. And some people don't like that. They're like, I didn't get into this business to do that. I got into this business to be with people, well, show them houses, right? I, th I think most agents, and, and I would venture to say, you know, other service-based entrepreneurs, I, I think they have it in them and they're capable and nearly all, I believe. I think, I think the, the biggest hindrance in this is actually short-term thinking. So it, it, it you know, it's, it's not critically vital at any juncture to, to go out and make a hire or to um, train a new person. Like that's, that's not gonna affect this month's p &L, even next month's p or maybe not even, you know, three months from now. Um, and, and I think some people are just afraid to make that little short-term investment of time and money uh, that will lead to more success six months from now or, or a year from now, right? I, I think it's, you know, people it's point. Like, have this yeah. tendency to overvalue the short-term at the expense of the long-term. And I, I think that's where most people are, are, are messing up uh, when it comes well, to- Well, that's to like growth. Wall Street. I'm only interested in the next quarter. I'm not really thinking about what's going to happen later on down the line, right? But short-term thinking will, will, will give you short-term gains. And there's risk involved. What happens if I onboard this person, hand all this stuff for them to do that I'm doing, and it goes sideways? I'm right back where I started, only I wasted all that time and all that money. That's a very, very real uh, thought process for a lot of entrepreneurs. So as a coach, I sometimes got to coach them around that and say, well, what are the risks of not doing this? Right. You came to me because things weren't working. Nobody comes to a coach because everything's going smoothly. I've never gotten that phone call. Hey, Henry, uh, everything's clicking on all cylinders, but I think I need a coach. Right. The day that that happens, I'll retire. Um, no, people, people come to, to professionals like me to help them solve a problem. Uh, but initially, they may not know exactly what the problem is, right? Is the problem the messaging? Is the problem the market they're trying to, ex uh, um, trying to deal in is too crowded or it's too small, right? There's a lot of, you know, if you want to be in an area where we're doing deals on, you know, $100,000 houses or whatever. If that's, if, if that's what there are, if there are scores and scores of them, the pickings might be easy. But then again, there's no barriers to entry for other people to come in. So the competition may be fierce. Conversely, if you want to deal in multi-million dollar properties, there may be less people playing in that, but there's also a lot less opportunities there. Again, it depends on the market. Right. When I lived in Westchester, New York, there was no market 
you know, below 500,000 because there simply weren't any properties. Um, and if, but if you wanted to deal with the $10 million properties, it became very much a beauty pageant. Uh, there were a lot of other things that went into becoming a successful broker in that area beyond your ability to, to just show houses, right? You needed a book of business, you needed contacts, you needed a lot of stuff. What are, what are the challenges that you see in the, the people that you coach, the common ones that are already at that million dollar level and you know, maybe they've plateaued, maybe they've, maybe their margins have shrunk a little, like what are, what are, what are the challenges that, that the entrepreneurs as business owners at that level are seeing and, and how did, how do they push through those? Uh, all right. So there's a whole, whole bunch of different challenges. Um, one, one is they don't really know what the end game is. Right. So I'll ask them, what's your exit strategy? And they're, they're saying, I have no idea. It's like, well, let's see if we can get an idea. Right. Are you looking to scale up and sell? Are you, if you're maybe not in the real estate business, but if you're in another business, are you, if you're in the tech business, cause I deal with a lot of people in the tech business, are you looking to, to be acquired, to do uh, an IPO? Uh, do you just want to run this uh, until they carry you out, you know, horizontally? Do you want to give it to a family member? You know, I've got clients uh, both currently and in the past who are looking to groom their children to take over the business. Well, they may not want to take over the business, right? So these are conversations you need to have very, very early on because that could really throw a monkey wrench into your plans later on down the line. A lot of people are like, you know what? I just want to die with my boots on, right? I'm just going to run this thing until I can't do it anymore. Right. I mean, the average real estate agent, and you can correct me because you're plugged into this more, I think it's 58 years old. Right. And I think it's a female as well. Pretty sure those are the numbers. They may be dated a couple of years. So um, I'm 61 years old. So they're only a couple of years younger than me. And you got to ask yourself, how long do I want to be doing this? Right. Have I put away sufficient money or have enough properties or whatever that if I decide in a couple of years, I want to slow down or I don't want to do this, or I want to buy an RV and travel through the country that I can do it. Um, and, or, or conversely, do I have enough of a system in place here with my business that I could sell it to somebody else? Right? Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of the challenges once, once you're hitting that, this, this million dollar and up level that only 4% of, businesses you know get to less probably less than one percent of real estate agents get to the the real challenge becomes how do you how do you get it to operate without you how do you reduce sure. the key man risk how, how do you make it something that someone else might want to buy um you know things like that succession plans like i think a lot of a lot of agents really don't you know most probably over 90 percent i i would guess don't have any type of succession Plan. No. I mean, how many of them really think of themselves? I'll ask you because you deal with this on a daily basis. Uh, how many people really think of themselves as entrepreneurs? Not, not enough for sure. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that. I, I, yeah. I would, I would guess it's under 10% that really have that, that, that mindset. Um, right. um, most of them, most of them are really running a self in, in, you know, self-employed job, basically, like they own their I, I call it a, I call it a money-making venture. So are you running a business or are you running a money-making venture, right? So I would dare say you're probably right. About 90% of them are looking at it like I'm, I'm running a money-making venture. But if I don't participate, look, I'm a solopreneur as a coach. If I don't coach, I, I get no income. I don't have anybody to step in if I want to go on a vacation. Um, I don't. So when I go on vacation, I end up doing client calls, which makes my wife a bit unhappy. But it's like, no, <laughs> this is this is part of the deal, right? This is this is the deal. And the wonderful thing is because I coach people remotely and I coach them all over the world via via Skype or via Zoom or via phone. Um, it's not a big deal. I just carve out the time when I need to, and um, I can still, I've, I've gone, you know, all over the world. Last year in the summer, I went to Greece, and if I have to talk to my clients from afar, it's no big deal. 
In fact, sometimes it's even more convenient because they're, they're in Europe. So it's like, hey, we're pretty close to the same time zone, right? Gives us more flexibility in terms of scheduling. So we work around that. And the real estate profession's the, the, the same thing, you know? That it, it's very freelance, right? It's very, every day is a little different. Who, who do I got to show? What properties do I have to show? That's not for everyone, right? That's a certain, there's a certain personality type that is drawn to the idea that every day is a little bit different. Um, that's one of the essential attributes of successful entrepreneurs is that they're fine with that. It's not a curveball if today things hiccup. It's just normal. It's like the course of doing business. What's the, the typical time frame? You know that you would say once someone hires you, you learn about their business, start giving them feedback and actual items that they can implement. Like, how long does it take for them typically to to see measurable results? To see results, you should see them within the first three months. Uh, uh, for my, my all in coaching program, I only require people three months. Well, we'll know then whether we're simpatico. Um, I have a sort of a lower end program, which is really designed for the under million dollar businesses because it's a little more economical. But what I discovered with those, those folks is they last about six months and then they burn, they, they kind of like burn out or they, or whatever, something goes a little bit sideways. My personal opinion is it starts to get really hard, right? Because you have to change things. I'm not here as a coach to force people to do things differently, just to, just to you know, part of it is just illustrating how you're doing things is not working. Let's, tr let's try some other things. Well, that involves change, right? And people get used to doing things a particular way. So circling back to the, the, the gentleman who had this app, um, that ran on an iPad that was a really neat, interesting app for real estate professionals. But then what he discovered is um, they just kind of like to do things the way they're doing them. Um, and the, the, um, the feedback that he got beta testing it was, I don't want to adapt to this system, even if this system does things better than I do it, because I'm used to and I'm comfortable doing things the same way right? That's very typical of human beings. But then me as a coach, I'm going to come back and say, well, then why are we talking? Because if it was working so beautifully, there wouldn't be any need for this. There are things that are going to have to change. There's a, you know, in the 12-step program, they say, uh, nothing changes if nothing changes, right? It's like a little coin. I've, I, I've seen them. And it's like, that's a little bit of homespun wisdom that makes a lot of sense. So as you start getting into the process, your brain is going to start to hurt a little bit because you're going to have to do stuff a little differently than you were doing it. And you're going to hit what I call resistance. You're going to resist that. And what happens is a lot of times people, they resist it and they say, you know what, I'd just rather go back to the devil I know. And that happens all the time. Well, I'm not surprised that the... The, the, the success rate is higher for the people that are investing more. And I've, I've always found that the, the people that are having the highest level of success in, in any business, really, they're the ones that are like buying the front row tickets at conferences and, and spending more time on the training, you know, even though they probably need it the least, right? They're the yeah. ones that they just have that mentality of wanting to continue and, and learn. And, and really it's, improving themselves, but then that improves everything that they, they do. They're playing big. In coach speak, we would say, you want to play small or you want to play big? And I've used that phrase many times before. Now, that doesn't mean taking irrational risks on things, right? It, it, it doesn't. There's a, there's a story that I've told before. I'll tell you this one very briefly. There's a gentleman by the name of Jerry Delafamina. He ran a... a um, very successful ad agency in New York City, way back, back in the day. I think it's probably like the 70s or so. And business was really, really, really bad. And it was so bad that he decided that he was gonna take like the last $50,000 or whatever it is that they had in the bank account. And he was gonna just throw a huge party, like an Irish wake. But he didn't tell everybody that it was an Irish wake, but he just threw this party and he invited you know, clients and former clients because he was ready to close up shop. 
And then something funny happened. Everybody saw saw this party, uh, just assumed he was a raging success, and he picked up five new clients that night and saved the business. <laughs> right? So um, there's that. There's always that. I'm not suggesting that anybody do that, um, but it you know it, it it can be done, right? You you need to what do they say? F fake it till you make it. You need to give off the vibe. Does that mean you've got to, you know, get front row tickets to a game to show the world that you're, you're a big shot? A lot of those people are not big shots, right? They're, they're fakes. Um, so anyway, go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, well, no, we've talked a lot about, you know, helping business, what you do to help business owners improve their business and, and some of the common, I think, pitfalls that you know, people or, or challenges that, that, that people have. Uh, another aspect where, where you help people that I'd like to talk a little bit about is, is just overall financial uh, literacy, right? Like right. If, if you're going to be call it making the more intelligence. Yeah. So the, the more money that you make, obviously the, the more you have to, to protect and, 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 and grow and, and, you know, you're going to have a lot more options and, and, you know, what, what are some of the things you cover? I know you, you, you wrote a pretty lengthy book actually uh, detailing a lot of this as well, but give us, give us kind of the nutshell of that, that book and, and some of the things you think that the average business owner can do, real estate agent can do to improve their personal financial situation. So yeah, my book, it's a big book. It's 432 pages. I actually wrote it as a course at first. And then some very smart people convinced me to turn it into a book, uh, which was a you know, like a year long project uh, to do it right. Let's put it that way. Um, I started when I wrote this book, I started um, I just wrote 18 chapter headings and then I started at the beginning and I went to the end and I started with the first chapter being the psychology of money. Right. What are what is your mental framework when it comes to money? Many, many, many people, I would say the most common archetype is living in scarcity. You know, my mother was the, was the poster child for scarcity mindset. She was a depression baby born in 1927. So all of those uh, early years were, were imprinted by living through the depression in New York City. And, you know, she could never shake that. And for most people, those early childhood, I'm not a psychologist or anything, I know enough to be dangerous, but um, those early childhood um, experiences color their decision-making for the rest of their life. So I, I teach people, I've been teaching the guys in my mastermind group about stock charts and things like that, um, but I can't force them to put on a stock trade, right? They may look at that and say, that is incredibly risky, it's just not for me. Right. No more than than you could get somebody in the real estate business to say, hey, I'm not going to build a spec house. I built spec houses. Uh, I had a partner back in about 15 years ago and I wrote about it in my book. He committed suicide. It's a whole big story. I've talked about it in detail on other on other podcasts. He left me holding a multi million dollar bag as the only guarantor and he blew through all the money and we were building multi million dollar spec houses. So uh, I learned some valuable lessons in that about uh, managing risk or the illusion of managing risk when you when you really weren't. So you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, as a real estate professional, what there's a lot of different sandboxes I can play in, which one am I most comfortable with? That's probably the one that you want to get started. Right is the one that I'm most comfortable with. Nah, I just want to be a broker. I just want to work on, you know, low end houses and make a, a couple bucks on commission and that's good enough. And then, but then you've got to start thinking to yourself, how do I level up from here? Do I eventually want to invest in this? Do I maybe want to become a hard money lender and invest some of my money in projects that I'm familiar with? Figure out that strategic path that you want to follow. And, you know, as you execute, you, know, you may have to make some pivots. It's just how things work. But without a plan, you have no idea. So the next part of my book is, is really about 
taking a snapshot of where you are in your financial world, your balance sheet, your income statement, and figuring out what kind of plan do I want to have pretty much for the rest of your life, right? You never get a break from planning. You never get a break from bills. One of the things we've seen in the pandemic, I think loud and clear, is that even if the economy stops and your income stops and you lose your job, the rent's due, the electric's due, everything's due. They don't care. Every month goes by and it's due. Uh, that's inescapable. And then I talk a lot about different investing, including real estate, stocks and bonds, um, commodities, futures, pretty much anything and everything that I could think of that might be valuable. Some of it will resonate. Some of it is like, I'm never going to trade commodities. Uh, I don't, um, you know, I don't need to, to know about this. But I think you do kind of need to know about it. Yeah, I, I, uh, um, I, I think as real estate agents, you, you know, if, if you, you, if you take some of these basic steps, like, like just taking a snapshot of where you are, like yeah. so many people don't, don't do that. Like, you know, know, know your net worth, where your exposures are, where your potential liabilities, uh, you know, could, could, could bite you from, from behind or like, and protect against that. And then use your expertise, kind of like you were saying, like, use your knowledge, your expertise, your access to deals to, to do things that will enable you to get investments that have a higher, you know, risk first reward ratio than, than someone who's not getting access to, to that or, or having this specialized knowledge of, of, you know, what it is you do. Well, as a broker, you, you have time risk, right? But a broker doesn't have any skin in the game, right? So if you're showing a $500,000 house that's got a, you know, whatever, 6% commission on it, right? So there's a potential $30,000 profit in there. Uh, but maybe you've got a co-broke. Obviously, the house takes a big chunk of that. So what does that mean to you? Well, maybe you can make, I don't know, I'll make up a number, $6,000, right? On the, out of that 30,000, maybe you make 20% of that. I don't know if those are the numbers, you probably, these days at least, things have changed. Um, but in the past, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't unusual. But your risk is zero other than the time it takes to find a, a buyer. And you could probably do the math on that and say, well, it took me 20 hours to find a buyer and I made $6,000, right? So what did I make? 300 bucks an hour or something like that? Not so bad. Um, but there is really no risk other than time risk which is fine. If you're now going to put hard money into a deal and say, okay, uh, I've, I'm good at, at selling these houses. Maybe I want to take some of this money that I've made and actually invest in it. Uh, that's, you know, the next level, right? You can still probably save yourself commission money and save yourself a lot of heartache by actually being the one who's going to sell the property. But now you have an ownership interest in it. Right? And then from there, you can start thinking to yourself, okay, well, now I'm going to buy some properties and instead of flipping them, I'm going to keep them and turn them into rentals. What's the risk involved with that? Right? Cash flow risk, all sorts of other stuff. Um, and then you go from there. Right? And the ones who were successful, they all started small. And then all of a sudden, they own 400 properties. Right? That's just kind of how it works. But for every one of them, there are going to be hundreds who either never took the leap or did and flamed out, right? What separates those people? And we were just talking about, it's kind of that mentality, go big or go home, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, no one, no one got to a hundred doors or a uh, hundred properties without buying the, the first one. Right? Yeah. So, so everybody, everybody starts small. It's just a lot of people don't take that first step. Right. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give you a real concrete example. We were just down in Atlantic City the, yesterday for the weekend on kind of like a, a um, socially distant uh, weekend with some friends of ours. And, um, and they're, one of their kids, who we've known since he was born, uh, wants to get into the real estate development business. And uh, I said, you know what, I'll, I'll back him any day of the week. He needs some capital to get started, as long as he's going to do the work. Right. If you ever watch Shark Tank, they bet on people. They don't bet on ideas. People have been buying and flipping and, you know, buying low and selling high for, for 
for decades. What separates it? It's the person, it's the operator. You watch Shark Tank and you say, oh my God, that's an amazing idea. But the guy who's, who's behind it is really flaky and nobody backs him. And then other people come up and it's like, oh my God, what a cockamamie idea. But you can just tell they're really good. And then all of a sudden the sharks are in a bidding war, right? We bet on people. We don't necessarily bet on processors or ideas. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I think it, it really all, it all starts on just having confidence in yourself and, and, and taking that first step. And, um, you know, when it comes to your own personal financial, uh, trajectory, like nothing really could be more important than going out and, you know, reading a book like yours and others and just getting, getting the, the skills to, to build the confidence, to, to take the steps needed to, to do this. And, and so few people, I, I think, dedicate the time and, and resources to it, but it's just, it's just so important that, that people do. So I, I thank you for, you know, writing the book and providing this type of coaching education to people. It was my pleasure. Um, we we got to wrap up now. Uh, but okay. before we do, I, I was in with the, a hyper fast round if you're ready for some oh, rapid fire. I've done this before. Speed round. I love this. All right. What is the biggest piece of advice you would give to a new entrepreneur? Big, biggest piece of advice. Surround yourself with super smart people from the get-go. Whether you have to pay them or barter with them or just leverage your friendship just make a list and go through all of these people who can help you be successful and listen to what they have to say. You don't have to agree with everything they say, but create that, you know, neural network. You know, Elon Musk is doing this thing now where he's, you know, I don't implanting stuff. So, so one of my kids was trying to explain it. It was like, went over my head, but it's like, it's like crowdsourcing brains, right? <laughs> Real rocket science. Uh, I'm like, I have no idea, but I do like the idea of uh, two heads and three heads and 10 heads are better than one, but be careful mm. because you can get analysis paralysis if you get too many voices in your head, right? So you do, you, there has to be uh, an element of caution there. But ultimately, you know, even, even Bill Gates, which I remember him saying years ago that I surrounded myself with people smarter than me, right? Um, he's got to have the good sense to listen to them. Uh, that's really, really important because to be an entrepreneur, you got to have a certain level of arrogance that you know everything. Um, and then what you find out is uh, one cold day, I don't know everything, right? have those people in your hip pocket when the situations arise where you need help. Get them All right. What's the biggest challenge you've ever had in business and how did you overcome it? Um, the biggest challenge was when my, my partner, Bob, not his real name, uh, jumped off a perfectly good bridge and uh, I had to scramble and was getting sued by everybody in the Western hemisphere. That was the biggest challenge that I ever had to undertake. It was my own fault. I ignored risk and paid the price for it. And, but I hired a lawyer and I went through the process and I was able to come out the other end a little battered and bruised. Um, financially, uh, wasn't, it cost me, the lawyer cost me all the 5,000 bucks, but I had a lot of sleepless nights. It took like three years, really was a, a humbling lesson right out of the, the real estate business. And I hope people now in the overheated market have the good sense to not throw caution to the wind and, and be smart about it. Because when you're in, a, in that boom thing, people have a tendency to over leverage themselves. Um, so, so be careful, I guess is the, the watchword. All right, what's the biggest financial mistake, personal financial mistake that you see people making that, that you wish you could change? Well, it kind of, kind of dovetails in nicely what I just said. Um, they, they're all over the return on investment, the ROI. They could tell you the alpha, how much money I'm gonna make. What they can tell you is how much money they could potentially lose. You know, they ignore the risk and they, they, miss, they get seduced by the return 
without really taking into account the risks associated with it, right? So we could, we could, you know, this this friend of our son who wants to get in the real estate business, he's going to start small. If if I were to give him say fifty grand to invest in a deal, I do that knowing that I could lose one hundred percent of that. I'm okay with that, right? You got to ask yourself. Am I going to be, is it, are my kids going to have to take out college loans because I lost 50 grand on this speculative real estate business, right? Some people will say, well, yeah, but I'm willing to take the risk. Really? Are you really, really willing to take the risk? Because there's a pretty good chance that it could crater. Now, that's an extreme example. Have to assess risk in all areas of your life, right? We were talking about the, you know, the plan there are today's liabilities and then there's the future liabilities, right? You got a three little kids. What's it gonna cost to send them through college, right? If you've got three kids under the age of 10 these days, it could cost you a million dollars by the time they come of age. Do you, are you planning to do that? Or are you planning to, to borrow that money and let the kids come out with $300,000 of debt at 22 years old and have to let them pay it off, right? These are all things that you have to think about. It's unpleasant. People don't want to think about it. My job is as a coach is to force you to think about it because the stakes are too high. All right, what, uh, what would we find you doing when you're not coaching or, or writing or working on your business? Oh my God, you'll find me on the golf course. That's where I would be now. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 uh, I have played more golf since the coronavirus started than any year ever. I don't even know how many rounds I've played. Uh, my kids are all golfers. So and my 23 year old son is home. He graduated from college and he's sort of looking for a job in the worst job environment in the world. So he's like, dad, you wanna play? It's like, yeah, twist my arm, let's go play. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's like the main, my main thing. If we weren't in a in a virus, I would be traveling. I traveled all I traveled all over the world. I love to travel. Um, I exercise, but my gym is closed, so I'm I'm at a little alternative gym. I like to do that, and I read and I write and I write two blogs, and I'm writing a new business book, and I write screenplays, and I collect baseball cards. I do a lot of stuff. So, but golf's the main thing. Uh, all right. What, what's, your, what's your hand with all this practice sorry? you've been getting? What's, that? Oh, what's my handicap? What's, what's your handicap right now? My, handicap, yeah. my official handicap is 12.9, but my handicap now is probably about a nine. Uh, it really depends on how I putt. Um, my kids got me a new putter last year. I'm still not quite used to it, but I bought myself a brand new Sim driver from TaylorMade, top of the line driver in three wood and um, hitting the ball further. Still haven't quite figured it out, but I'm, I'm always tinkering with my game, tinkering with my swing and doing different things. So I've been, I've been tinkering with different shots. So I don't always shoot the greatest score, but last year I went to St. Andrews and I played a Balcombe, I shot a 77. It was the best round that I've best best round I've ever shot. So, so I know nice. I have it. I know I can do it. <laughs> All right, last question: Where do you see yourself in five years? Five years. Um, so, my wife and I are planning to move out of New Jersey, where we live right now, because we're basically empty nesters. Um, but that's why we've been looking for real estate out in Las Vegas which I think is gonna be our probably nine months out of the year home. What we haven't figured out is what are we gonna do for the other three months when it's 115 degrees in Vegas? So that's kind of what we're working on. So we're, you know, we're looking at properties, but I think we'll be happily ensconced uh, in, you know, nice weather and golf playing weather for most of the year, somewhere in the desert. And then the rest of the year, I'm not quite sure yet. I haven't quite figured it out. Um, but we'll be somewhere I'm happy and healthy. I hope maybe in an RV driving from national park to national park. I don't know. We'll see. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show before we wrap up, uh, where, where can people find your, your book? And if they want to connect with you or, uh, contact you, what are, what are the best ways for them to do that? So, um, I started, I've been doing a lot of podcasts. I've probably done about 30 since the lockdown. 
and I've decided recently that I'm going to, I'm going to offer a month of free coaching to um, anybody who listens. So it could be either entrepreneurial coaching or, or money coaching or a little bit of both. So I set up a landing page. It's podcast.dasknowledge.com and Das Knowledge is D-A-A-S, my last name, two A's and one S, not not two S's and one A. Um, so they can go there or you can just go to dasknowledge.com. If you, if you nosy around in there on the FQ tab, you'll, you'll find a link to a landing page to download the book for free. I give it away for free. I want, you know, the only person who makes money on books is Jeff Bezos. So uh, <laughs> and he's already got enough money. Uh, so I'm happy to give it away for free. People, people can read it. I think they'll learn a lot. Uh, and they can learn about the course that I sell and all that sort of happy stuff. So that's it. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show and thank you everyone for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Hyper Fat Show. Subscribe to us if you want to make sure you get the latest and greatest Hyper Fat Shows. And remember, we love reviews. Reviews help us bring better and better guests and improve our shows. So give us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you want to see more, click right here. And if you're new to this channel, click below to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out. And leave some comments about what you think on the videos. I'll see you next time.